Welcome to the DM Roundtable. I'm Opal from Flutes Loot, and I'll be hosting this series tonight. We've got a great discussion lined up, and I think that we'd like to introduce all of our guests first. Go ahead and uh, give your channel name and plug whatever projects you have, and then let's uh, throw in there, say what your favorite monster is. Let's start with Fred. Hi, my name is Fred Wheeler. I run the How to D&D YouTube channel. I talk about anything to do with Dungeons and Dragons mostly and RPGs for players and dungeon masters. And uh, I run online classes. Mimic. I like the mimic. Thanks, Fred. And Fred is the orchestrator of DM Roundtable series. So most of, of the videos for this is on his channel. So be sure to check him out. Dennis, let's go with you. Thanks, Opal. Hi, I'm Dennis. I run the OKest DM YouTube channel, and that is where I make mistakes running games so that you don't have to. If I had to pick a favorite monster, you know, gun to my head, I would probably try to get away with saying just all dragons. That's fair. Um, so they call you the OKest DM, but do they ever ask you if you're okay? <laughs> no, I just end every video with everything will be okay. <laughs> Um, Alex, let's go with you next. Uh, hey, I'm Alex, uh, more commonly known as The Bear Bard. I run a YouTube channel where we go over um, different TTRPG stories. Uh, it ends up being mainly horror stories, but it could be all different stories from the space and just kind of see what we can draw from that, good, bad, and different, and uh, try to follow bad examples to make your games a little bit better. Uh, also trying to do some other stuff. Uh, Fred, I am surprised. I thought you were going to say Black Pudding. Definitely, I uh, thought that's where you're going to go with that. Uh, as far as my favorite uh, <clears throat> monster, uh, that's a tough one. I, I, what I love to do is I love to use 5e tools and then just randomly pick one. I'm like, that thing looks cool. Let's use that guy. Uh, but I love kobolds. I love I love throwing a bunch of little guys in traps and and stuff like that. So I think somewhere right now, Wally DM is smiling when I mention traps. So yeah, awesome. Thanks, Alex. And are you more bear or bard? Uh, definitely more on the bear side. Uh, the bard, uh, it's a bit deceptive because my bard is my storytelling, but people keep trying to get me to sing and then I have to disappoint them and tell them I have zero singing ability. So, but then Skyrim, I'm waiting for my, my royalties on that new Skyrim mod that's been going around with the bear bard. That's have you exciting. guys seen that? It's, it's a new mod. Someone made it totally random. I, I, I probably have nothing to do with it, but it's, it's literally, it, it's this bear that has a, a, a loop, but they, it comes out with like dragon force or something like that. It's in oh game. My gosh. It's a summon. You, you just summon this bear bard in game and now it's, it's taking over my SEO. So it's, it's, you know, getting my SEO back. Yeah. For better or for worse. Right. <laughs> uh, Denny, let's go with you. I mean, you're last. Hi there, everybody. My name is Denny Dicely. I'm going to be stuck in a, in a uh, Barbie smiling uh, kind of face here tonight. Very one note. Um, I run the Dicely D&D channel where I uh, have created a series on teaching people how to play D&D as well as host many of these Dungeon Master Roundtables. I also run the Play Dicely channel, which is an actual play. We're 35 sessions in. And uh, my favorite monster, I might have to say, is the Doppelganger. Uh, that's a good one. It could be anything, right? <laughs> you have a yes. catch all. I uh, love to play the intrigue. I think that we should, you should re-record everything, but just like voiceover, and then we'll just impose it over this video. Does that sound fair to you? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, in today's discussion, I want to focus on storytelling as DMs or as players. I think that... Oftentimes we try to cultivate a more meaningful game and it can be kind of hard for new DMs to figure out how that works. So hopefully with these questions, we'll be able to find some commonalities that might inspire DMs or give them some tips. So for the first question, some suggest that dungeon masters are storytellers and others describe them as referees to the story as told by the players. So I'm going to ask what your thoughts are on these two descriptions, if you have any insight on which one you utilize more. Um, let's start with Alex on that. Ah, on the spot. Uh, no, actually, it's actually a really interesting um, argument because I think like in most things that there needs to be a balance to it. I mean, the problem with referee, I hate that term because it, it brings a um, power gaming kind of thought to it when you just say the word referee. And it's like, <clears throat> I've seen the those... Uh, 
those memes and I covered a couple of them, just like you need to just be off to the side and do the thing. But I think the thing is, is that it needs, it's a collaborative thing, right? And so you want to be a storyteller, but you also are, it's not just your story. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the the best stories are when everyone gets together and and it's your story along with their story, the players. And so it really is, <clears throat> it's a little bit of, you know, you starting the story and you kind of like pushing it off in a direction, you know, like a bird, just throwing out the nest. But then part of it's like, like trying to just keep it in when your player's like, okay, let's go uh, jump the fence into the the king's, you know, bathroom, whatever, you know? Uh, and so you have to just kind of like, like, hold the reins and, and, and stop, you know, keep, keep it together as much as you can. I love that. Um, let's see what Dennis has to say. So like all things, when I'm presented with a binary option, like it's either this or this, I'm usually it's both. Um, I feel like there is a, I feel like every different game, every different group of people that plays this game together, will fall somewhere on a scale between the DM is the referee and the DM uh, is the main storyteller. I'm both as much as I can be. Like, I am the final say on the rules when I'm running a game. Uh, I also am responsible for, you know, providing the story hooks and, you know, telling the players what uh, happens in the world. Usually when I'm describing what the dm is to like a new player i will say or what dming is like i say it's like writing the first draft of a novel where you don't get to write any of the main characters that other people have to do that and it's extremely difficult to write a story uh, on purpose when you're doing that so i think just looking at it only from a story perspective can make it feel like it's a more difficult job than it really is when I have new players myself, I'll describe the uh, relationship between the DM and the players, uh, at least from a storytelling perspective. Uh, the player will say what their a character attempts to do, and it is the DM's job to describe how the world around them reacts to that attempt. Uh, and DMs get to use dice to help them tell that story. Yeah, I kind of describe it as... The DM is like the author, but he's got, or she, I guess, they have ghost writers who kind of fill in all the small details that you can skip. And that's what the players do. They fill in the details to your overarching story. Uh, Fred, what do you have? Um, I would say it's definitely both. And I think one of the things that we, uh, we a lot of people sort of forget is you, you don't actually, I mean, a dungeon master doesn't actually just tell a story i kind of uh, put it down as it's more like facilitate an activity and uh, you might you might provide some of the ingredients probably not all of them but do you, when you actually make up the mix for the baking the cake which is basically your game uh, there's going to be some other people who come along somebody might chuck some grass in there um, an old snail and mix it all up um, somebody might decide to put in a few extra eggs whatever it is uh, and then, of course, it gets beat, beaten up. And then who knows how many times it's going to be beaten up by somebody. Um, uh, you know, it's it's like cooking in the worst way with like five or six people all at once. Like you never, nothing's going to be get, come out the way you expect it. And then th that's kind of how I would look at it. I think I think what happens is a lot of people have um, assumed that uh, sort of modern Dungeons and Dragons is storytelling. Whereas it actually there has always been storytelling in older versions of the game. And then a lot of people think uh, older version of the game is referee Dungeons and Dragons. Whereas the concept and terminology of referee in Dungeons and Dragons was very early on. And Dave Arneson actually got rid of that pretty quickly. And um, Gary agreed with it. And they used the term Dungeon Master um, to eliminate that concept and um, obviously there'll be somebody at the table that generally sort of overlook, oversees the rules and when to use the rules. But I know in my, at my table, like a lot of things are kind of discussed. We, we always have an agreement, whoever's dungeon mastering, they get to make the final say. And no, none of us really care about that aspect of it. When it's our turn, we're going to do it differently. Like, for example, my dungeon master right now, he runs invisibility different to me. And so we have to adjust each time. 
But when we're dealing with rules and the sort of the referee side of things, it's actually my group who will decide when we ban something or we keep something. You know what I mean? Uh, we did that with Silvery Barbs not that long ago. It's like we played with it. I, I exploited it and abused it as much as I possibly can along with another player until we all came to the assumption um, or a conclusion that it needed to go. So it wasn't like the dungeon master at the time was making that final decision. So a lot of groups actually kind of look like that and have looked like that in the past. There are obviously groups where people have like a, a dungeon master and the referee is like, they, they literally play it like they are the referee. Like if you don't do it my way, bam, you're gone. Um, but that's that's always existed. I think people assume that the story can only be built with one person. I've come across players who assume that the Dungeon Master presents everything like a platter and they just eat off the platter. But actually you need you need them to actually do part of the work. Otherwise it doesn't really work out very well. I think everything that I've ever had happen in my game, the vast majority has been a product of somebody doing something absolutely insane that I was not expecting. Yeah, I really appreciate the perspective on previous editions as well. Um, I know that we're kind of in the sphere of fifth edition, which is going away. So it's evolving continuously. Um, but it sounds like the storytelling aspect has al always been, you know, favored. Denny, do you have anything else to add? Uh, surprisingly, after everything that's been said, I do feel like I can still contribute to this. Um, I mean, yeah, of course, like we all know Dungeons and Dragons is a role playing game. This is a storytelling game. Both of those things are true. You know, it is both storytelling in a collaborative sense, but also we are here to have fun through playing this game. Yeah, I mean, there's certain terminology which people might be a bit hesitant to use or maybe doesn't accurately describe one's DM style. I, for my myself, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a referee of the rules. I'm more like a rules adjudicator and a story guide, because that kind of drives home the idea of I'm I play a role in this, but I'm not I'm not the one voice on the matter. And I think at a point, too, like we do have these kind of hats we wear as DMs. You know, we are storytellers. We are um, managers of the mechanics. Uh, but also, I think we can add a third hat to ourselves in that we, depending on how far you want to go, we become game designers as well. You know, like the core of D&D 5e itself is allowing people to pick and choose what they want out of the base rule set and altering that in order to create the tabletop role playing game experience that your table wants. Like I do a lot of homebrew, so I create I've created my own setting, race, lore, what have you. That's game design. Setting up encounters, which most DMs will do, that's game design, though you've given the tools to do so. Uh, your party goes into a tavern and they want to play darts. There's no rules for darts, so you're going to have to game design those mechanics to do so. So when DMs become inspired to create components and rules or use the mechanics of D&D to create something original that isn't already in the books, like we 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 do a lot for these these games um and i think both are true you know the storytellers the referees but also the game designers perfectly said thank you thank you all i i mean i think i've i agree with what most of you have said it is not a binary choice between you're either a storyteller or a referee i i ultimately see it as the dm is telling a story that players are reacting to um, but overall, the DM has the goals in mind, the plot points, the conclusion. They have to guide them through all of that. And like you said, Fred, is that um, stuff happens and players do things that you don't expect. And you have to adapt either in the moment or throughout the whole campaign. But I think ultimately it's um, like DMs really have to be prepared to be strong storytellers because they're the ones orchestrating the story. Overall, I would say that players, from my experience, unless the players are like, super experienced and they know they can kind of break the game. Um, most of them try to stay within bounds of what the DM has planned. You know, there's obviously exceptions to that rule, but I would say that DMs, there's a strong case for DMs to work on their storytelling and be very strong storytellers so that they can guide the players through all of their points and plot points and, and so forth. All right, uh, next question. So D&D &D can be very task oriented. And Denny pointed out in the preliminary discussion that this might mean something different to everyone. So what I mean by task-oriented is that sometimes players go from quest to quest 
And those quests exist in a bubble separated from the other quests to where there's not really an overarching story or plot or consequences, perhaps, apart from maybe some character development and leveling up. Contrast this method to more modern playing uh, DMs suggest focusing on storytelling instead of just these quest by quest. So I want to know what the benefits are and the disadvantages to playing this storytelling centric approach. All right, let's have Denny go first. Uh, I, I very much consider myself a storytelling DM, so I, I feel like this is a fantastic approach. Um, some of the benefits from going with this, you know, overarching narrative style of, of play is I think that you can you can really begin to reduce prep time as it becomes more of a game of reaction instead of having to prepare for every eventuality, you know, it's like, where's the story going? Well, logically, okay. If they're doing this, then what would be the interesting thing or event to come next, you know, preparing it in a, an event style, as opposed to like an encounter style. Uh, I, I would suggest, you know, having player characters, backstories heavily inform the overall story. So it's not just on you to create this grand overarching plot, but you can weave their stories into this grand thing. And it makes it much more uh, investment and immersive for your characters. And also the story is almost guaranteed to be something that they'll enjoy because it's something that they helped create. With a deeper focus on players and the characters, you get greater opportunity to understand what their characters and players are about. So you can begin to learn and focus on what you need to develop in your world building and whatnot. Um, great opportunity to practice improvisation. Um, you can throw combat balance out the window because it's just like, well, what makes sense to be in this scene? Oops, it just happens to be 100 orcs. I hope you guys are have enough sense to run away from 100 orcs. And if they're into this style of gameplay, one of the more rewarding things for me is that the player characters might strike up conversations with each other in the game and allow me to sit back and just watch as the scene unfolds. And it is just so satisfying for me. Um, some disadvantages with this approach, with this storytelling heavy game, is if you're not used to improv improvising, that's going to be a skill that you're going to need to become more comfortable with as it's going to be procced a lot. As I mentioned before about the combat balance, combat could be more lethal than anticipated or more underwhelming than you expect. It's harder to plan encounters on battle maps if you just decide that, oh, combat breaks out. And you, Well, how are you to know? The narrative just led you here. And tactical players might build characters with combat in mind and might find themselves underserviced. We all have different types of player styles at our tables, I'm sure. You know, we have the actors, we have the... Uh, the dice rollers who who want to hit something. So it's figuring out the balance of how to appease all the players at your table. Hopefully I left enough for everybody else. <laughs> that was perfect. But let's see. Um, Alex, how about you go next? I have nothing to say. He took everything. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it, it's, no, it's, it's actually a really interesting one. So I probably have uh, less DMing experience than most people here. Uh, I've, yeah, obviously, I've, I've been doing it. I really enjoy it. But I found myself the first campaign I was doing. Uh, I found this issue where I was like kind of going down and doing quests, like individual quests, like running it almost like Skyrim, where, you know, and I realized I wasn't like we all just were kind of like going through motions, um, especially because I got into it because I wanted to tell story and and just kind of wing it and stuff like that. And so uh, halfway through, I just kind of switched it up and because I was following which was my first game. So I was following a module and that's that's where I was trying to go. And I just started doing what I wanted to do and really just kind of like ignoring this mostly or, or like taking like the base points of this and just letting it, opening it up into like a whole thing, not listening to their own, you know, the, the quest points on what you need to do to pass the quest, but making my own. And it really <clears throat> opened up the game for me. It felt much more enjoyable and my players really got more into it. And so uh, I can see, I can see the benefits of both. Like, I think, uh, people that like the task oriented, uh, it's nice because you can keep things more organized, you know, okay, well, I have this quest and this is how you do it. And, and so, you know, if you take the time, like, like Denny was saying, if you take the time to, to <clears throat> go through and prep that stuff ahead of time, especially if you do like a lot, you know, you, you spend one whole day prepping quests that you can do for the next three months. That's great, you know, and then you could have rewards, especially if you go off an XP system, which I've never done. But if you go off an XP system, stuff like that's easier to keep track of. But, uh, you know, for me, it's it's a role play game. And so being able to just kind of 
go and tell a story uh, with your team, you know, that's, that's much more fulfilling, at least for me, you know, but, but, you know, Ubisoft keeps selling games. So there, there's something to that, that uh, Ubisoft, the game uh, approach where you just have a cavalcade of things to do, you know, and a checklist for people to go down and do those things. So there's, there's definitely room for both. Um, but I, I personally find it much more rewarding to, to be able to just, go and and create a story with with everyone and and um you know there's that that little bit of like oh crap what do i do now i didn't expect this to happen but that's what makes the best stories those are the ones that you remember you don't remember oh yeah i remember you know rolling some dice to to talk this person into finding the dragon that was in the bottom of the 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 lake that was one of the quests in the personal opinion thanks alex Let's go with you, Dennis. Uh, I'm also an extremely narrative DM. Like all of my games ever since I started playing uh, have been story oriented. That's just the kind of people I play with. I play with uh, the friends I play with in, for the most part, at least really enjoy the story more than they enjoy, you know, optimizing their character build. So that's what we focus on at the table. An advantage of this, from the DM's perspective at least, is what Denny already said, is you get to build the overarching story and thus do less prep before every single session. Uh, you don't have to prepare every single adventure individually, you just kind of build the story and they reveal themselves from the actions that the players took two, three, ten sessions ago. Even from session one, you can say, okay, we're going to go clear out these rats from a basement. Oh, one of the rats was a were rat actually, and you killed the mob boss's son by accident in this rat clearing out. Okay, now you've got the mob after you and everything, uh, my players really enjoy it when everything is connected. I like to think of it sort of like when you're reading, at least when I'm reading a book, if I put it down, it will be in the first couple chapters because I don't know the story. I'm not invested in it yet. Um, and that's and if I finish the first couple chapters and I keep going, I keep going all the way to the end of the book. And I feel like that's how my D&D campaigns run as well. So if players enjoy the first couple sessions, they're going to just get more and more and more and more invested the more we further this one story instead of having a whole bunch of standalone adventures. A disadvantage of having players that care more about the story than uh, the mechanics on their character sheet is that they don't always know what the characters can do when it is combat. This can be annoying to me, annoying to the other players, and I'm still um, working out how to best resolve this. I've tried a lot of different things, um, and most of my players have gotten pretty good. Uh, they've played their characters long enough where they understand what they can do now. So it's not as much of a problem as it is in the beginning of the campaign, but that's the pretty much the only issue I have with um, running more story oriented things than numbers oriented. Really good examples, by the way. Okay, Fred, you ready? Okay. Yep. I think I've got a, a better handle on what you're after now. Um, so I think partly, I mean, for me, I'm going to talk in terms of where I'm at. I don't really care what other people are doing. I'm just going to talk about what I've experienced and what I do. And Dennis is laughing because I've said this so many times before. So the first thing is I kind of feel like you need to have both. Uh, I found out that I have to have both for it to work for me and for my players. But there's there's another factor to all of that. And we even if you use a task orientated, um, you know, piecemeal, small quests, job board sort of style of game, rather than um, a storytelling um, adventure, and that is you still need to have a, a pretty strong central focus. Otherwise, you run into a whole lot of problems with your players with regard to their, where they go. Uh, they don't know what to do if they don't have a strong central focus. You can give them a strong central focus and they can tell you, no, I'm not interested in the slightest and they go in a different direction. But at least you, you kind of have to have that there, I've found. I found that I, it's, I think a lot of the time people assume that older adventures were task orientated over over storytelling orientated. Uh, one of the things I found was a lot of the early adventures 
that did have sort of like a, they were short, they weren't these long Wizards of the Coast campaigns that go from level 1 to level 15. Uh, they usually did have, most of them, the good ones, would have at least a paragraph, but not a lot. They will often will leave that to the players and the Dungeon Masters, but this is what I found with them, is they would have a, uh, a central goal, like there was something going on, like keep on the Borderlands, uh, one of the first adventures put out uh, for for beginners and so forth, and you look at that and you think, well, that's just a sandbox. You can go anywhere. You start at a castle and you just go wherever. But actually, it does state that your your task that you are set is to make the border lands safe again, and things are not going well here. So this is your home base, but you do actually have a central goal. Uh, that you actually are focusing on. Uh, and I think a lot of people, and this happens with adventures where there's only like a, they don't designate like paragraphs to the why you're doing it and they only put in like a couple of sentences. People forget they actually exist. Um, I, I can assure you the worst adventures I've ever run have always been the job board style and you just go from one job to the next and uh, there's no connection. But usually they don't do that. They, there will be a connection, but it's hard to put that connection through. Um, I think a really good example of a modern adventure put out by Wizards of the Coast who does this, is, and it's very, very poor in its sort of story structure, is Dragon of Ice by a Peak, which is very much a job board style. And if you compare it to something like Lost Mon of Thandalva, it has a much stronger central focus, even though it is actually broken up into pieces. The difference is you don't literally have a job board. And some of them are related to the central focus of the overall goal that they do talk about, like let's deal with the white dragon. But a lot of them have nothing to do with that whatsoever. So I found those to be the weakest. And you can tell that even in the older versions of the game that I've played with the pre-made adventures, you can tell which ones really suck because they just don't have a strong focus and the players feel lost. And I think the job board thing is has become more prevalent actually now because it's kind of what people expect from video games. And so they kind of, when they come into from playing video games into, into Dungeons and Dragons, they kind of feel like they're still playing a video game. The only difference is they're not necessarily pressing buttons if they're not on D and D Beyond, if they've got pen and pencil. But they're still they're still playing a video game in their head. Uh, it's just now if I go into water, I don't die. Do you know what I mean? So I I like the Lego brick style, but I've always found that if you use small adventures, you still have to find a way to tie them all together. And if you can't do that, players get lost. Um, it's very easy for an event, you know, for a um, an event-based adventure actually gets derailed probably more easily than a, a location-based adventure because if they don't follow the events and the sequence that you required and you don't have a decent sort of structure or have figured that out or improvised it, then everything comes tumbling down. Um, whereas you don't have quite that same problem with sandboxes, but the problem with the sandboxes, they can go anywhere and they might decide to say, I... I don't care about your central overarching goal. I'm going to just go do this. We're going to go shopping for four hours. Or um, we've we've decided we've decided that we don't really care about a white dragon um, killing all the townsfolk. We want to go and be pirates on the open sea and start up our own um, chain of um, food fast food um, shark restaurants. So I mean, yeah, I I think I've covered everything I needed to say, and I will stop. I want to circle back to the video game style because I've thought that as well in D&D. &D. Um, when players are playing it like a video game, there are so many problems with that, not caring about each other as much or the other characters playing with them. Um, but most importantly, everything is very task oriented and they're not interested in, you know, like developing relationships within d and I'm going to circle back to that. But when I've played in, for instance, an adventuring guild that takes quests from a job board, it's fun and there's a quick turnaround for resolutions. You know, you can kind of see the plot go and you know, like rise and fall really quickly within the same session. And that's fun. That's nice. But it does feel very tedious to me when we're playing um, these job board type games. And I, I just feel like there's no progression across the world. And I'm like, when I finish this, I know there's another one to do. And it just doesn't feel fulfilling to me, I suppose, as a player. Um, and maybe it's because I'm a romanticist or something, but I want to see my character enact emotional change in the world around them. 
Um, I want my sphere of influence to be more than just monster slaying. Um, I like those slice of life slice of life moments where I connect with like non-player characters or the other characters uh, players playing with me. But I can see how focusing on storytelling could lose the interest of players who are less interested in role-playing and just want to cut down some ugly monsters. If everyone isn't as invested in role-playing at the same time or together, um, I feel like it could be very hard for one person to, you know, buoy up the, the storytelling of the DM and draw out those moments. I think that um, when players choose to play Dungeons and Dragons like a video game, they lose that storytelling aspect of really connecting with the world around them. They just think, what can I harvest from this monster? Uh, what experience points can I gain? And they lose that person to person story, like telling the human story of we see evil in the world, or maybe we are the evil in the world. How does this change us? How do we change others? And I think for me, that's the biggest aspect of storytelling that I just latch onto for D&D. Does anyone have anything else to say about this question? It's a pretty broad question. Yeah, Alex. I'll try not to go into much ranty because uh, the video game argument I go on, uh, I I have gone on rants on my channel about, so I won't try to go too much into that. But uh, I, I think the biggest thing really with this is, is session zero. Um, your session zero is super important when it comes to this particular argument, because that's where you really can, can talk about. Cause I, I have, I have friends that they love um, doing that. <clears throat> that kind of like, like uh, I have some friends in a Witcher campaign right now. And that's all it is. It's just, it's literally them going from job board to job board. You're not serving any sort of, a, but that's, they love it. And that, that's, but that's the thing. They talked about it in session zero uh, and that that's what they wanted to do. And so the biggest thing is, is just really, really talking to people in session zero and, and make sure that your group knows, you know, lay down like, Hey, what are you guys wanting? What do I want? And then figure that out ahead of time. Cause yeah, the, the video game argument, I mean, video games are great. I love video, you know, a lot of us love video games, but they really can poison your experience with this. Because the, the, the thing is, is like, if you want to play video games, go play video games. It's it's a different medium and, and you lose what makes this medium special by thinking of it like a video game. And so you really need to keep those separated. Uh, exactly. I'm not going to go on too much of a rant about it, but that's just like when people start bringing in video games too, I'm just like, oh, I want to talk. But um, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is just really, in session zero, talk about it ahead of time. And, and I think the biggest thing too is, is some you can use the task stuff maybe in smaller amounts. It really is about serving the larger narrative. You know, um, make sure that it, it serves something larger instead of just like getting lost in doing side quests for the sake of side quests. You know, make sure that they're either establishing your world, establishing uh, maybe a character, you know, you can use it to establish your enemy, you know, an enemy. You know, maybe you have to do a bunch of tasks to clean up uh, uh, what your BBEG is doing, something like that. Make sure that it serves something larger than just a task. So just with Alex's example, is that this is a really good example of one of the strongest ways to build your whole story and your whole game. And that is when the players decide that they have an overall, they have decided that what they want to do is they want to go Witcher style monster hunting. So that's their central goal, right? It doesn't necessarily say, okay, we're going after one villain. There's going to be multiple villains. Uh, actually, this happened to me in my own game not that long ago. And and so it works because their central goal is always the same, and it doesn't matter for Alex um, what he puts forward as long as it fulfills what they were after was, we want to slash down and take down monsters and deal with whatever they're causing. Um, and maybe they'll kill them and maybe they won't. I mean, who knows, but they're going to be dealing with monsters. That's what they, that's what they signed on for. So that's a really good example of it. Recently, I actually stopped playing video games partially because I just don't have the time for it anymore, but also because even when I did, I would always play RPGs. I'd play Witcher, I'd play Skyrim, I'd play Mass Effect. Um, and I would never do the side quests. I, I would just blow right through the main story because that what that's what was interesting to me. And I think it's why I switched from playing RPG video games over to playing D&D because that's all D&D is when I run it is just that main story. We, there are no real, you know, side quests. You don't like go to the tavern and uh, say, uh, are there any rumors? Yeah, there's a giant messing up someone's field. Go kill it. Okay, 
done. Now what? Uh, here's some money. The end. Like that. That's just boring to me. I want there to be a large, overarching, you know, end goal uh, that it takes a lot of effort and you know, creative thinking and problem solving to get to. My notes are uh, more callbacks to points that got brought up earlier um, when uh, Dennis mentioned, you know, like some of his players are like they have these mechanics, but they don't fully understand like how to use them because they're so invested in the story. And it's like, yeah, it's fantastic. And this is a tip for anybody out there who's also experiencing similar things. Like what I do with my players is I try and find a narrative way like to use the mechanical features of their class uh, as like a narrative prompt, you know like the paladins got the, their divine smite i'm like okay well what does this divine smite mean in your story like in my campaign one of the characters was supposed to perform a divine smite as part of their uh becoming a paladin ceremony turned out froze their family in time and now they're also multi-classed wild magic sorcerer so now that divine smite holds a lot more emotional trauma in a way to that player character and they're not going to forget about that feature so finding ways to narratively use mechanics and give them story importance to the player characters might help and also going back to you know the event uh system easily being topable or toppleable i that's the wrong word but y'all know what i mean uh absolutely i agree um if you are able to work with your players very closely you know and cement their backstories in whatever setting you're developing like the deeper their investment is the more easily you can tap into their brains and trick them in the direction you want them to go because you know like what what is your player's goal uh, well i'm after i'm after the man who killed my father or whatever it's like well my plot's going over there there's a clue about the man who killed your father in that direction oh we must go that way <laughs> you know it's finding the ways to lead the carrot without being absolutely a uh, brute force about it. I would also add that even if you have a task oriented game, that doesn't mean that you can't have story telling in that as well, like involved. Um, I think that, I think it was maybe when Dennis was talking, I was thinking about this. Um, when your players can connect the tasks together, like you defeated this dragon, but now there's consequences, right? Like now like kobolds are after you because that was their deity or something. You still can go task oriented, task to task, um, but you can connect things and um, interests of the players, like with their backstories, for instance, uh, like Denny said. Um, I think that that's a really good way to figure out how to connect your players to the campaign more than just task orientation. I think that this leads really well into the next question where we'll discuss how to foster these deeper moments that players can have. When running or playing in a campaign, when has your group had a meaningful and rich experience that moved them in real life? Dennis, let's start with you. So I've had one goal to uh, sort of like on a bucket list of running D&D, &D, and that is to make every single one of my players cry at some point. <laughs> either because their character died or because something happy and super emotional is happening. And there are two moments that stick out a lot to me um, as far as very high emotions uh, running. Um, the first one is an NPC that I ran a long time ago. It was like he was much higher level than them and he was uh, like a sneaky ranger. So he was never, the players never actually saw him in combat. I never ran him in combat. He just hid and shot arrows. Um, and when the combat was over, the players would notice, oh, who was shooting arrows? And the NPC was, would go up and say, yeah, those arrows in the body, those are from me. And I never actually calculated any damage from him. They just knew he was around and uh, he did other things to show that he was really powerful. And at one point, he stole all of the players' equipment and escaped to a temple and the players went there and they were furious because he took all their money he took all their stuff and they just uh, had a combat where they fought him and killed him and at the end they found out because they had they had grown to like really like this guy and at the end they found out that he had actually tricked them he was cursed to live forever in pain and he had been hiding it from them and he needed to die from people that hated him inside this temple. 
And so he explained that as he's dying and uh, with the music and everything, I actually got a couple tears from my players. Uh, so just as a DM, that's a really proud moment uh, that I can think of. And it still sticks with the players that were a part of that as well. The other, <laughs> the other anecdote that I remember specifically is something that I just worked on for a really long time is a short paragraph long description of the big bad revealing himself, like transforming into the shadow dragon that he's been the whole time. And I won't go into details about what that was, but I spent hours and hours, way more longer than I should have planning out and like timing my delivery of this paragraph that I was reading out with the music that was play going to be playing in the background. And when that landed on my players, it was one of the another one of the most rewarding moments as a DM that I've uh, had. And I plan on doing that again every now and then just to, you know, get those uh, strong emotions both in myself and in my players in the future. That's those end up being the most meaningful, the richest and the most memorable experiences in our games. This might be an unanswerable question as a follow up, but how do you think it affected your players? You said that they remember it over time. That's a big reward, first of all, because I don't remember half the campaigns that I play or run. Um, so that's a good reward. But how do you think that it shaped them as players? I think it it set in stone what they were already doing to get up to that point um, because it was an enjoyable experience. So everything that they did to get there, they have been doing since that time. Alex, let's go with you next. <laughs> so I got a, I got a, a couple. And the first one I'm going to do, mainly because I'm assuming that most of these are going to be more positive. And uh, <laughs> within the first like two months of me playing DD, uh i had a buddy of mine he was uh in this house with uh, a bunch of other he's just a bunch of roommates and they played DD. they're the ones that got us into it it was uh three five and uh we had this other guy that we knew you know kind of one of those people that just was, were always around and uh, we all got together and we started playing some DD. half of us had never played before never done any of it before well, the, the, the my one buddy, he played kind of a dick of a character. It's just what he played. He was, I mean, like he was playing it well, but he was just kind of a dick of a player, uh, a character. You know, it was all in game. One of the other guys at the table wasn't taking it well. And, uh, you know, because he was just being kind of combative and stuff like that. And then at, by uh, uh, after a couple, you know, about an hour or two of this, uh, the guy literally stands up, punches the table. And he just says, I'm going to walk out because... If I don't, I'm going to punch you in the face. And I can tell you that that happened in 20, 2009. We still laugh about it on a weekly basis, even now in 2022. It is the most funny thing. But it, it's it's one of those things that's like, you know, if you don't, um, if you don't handle the situation, you know, the uh, the DM was very, created a very competitive environment. And so it's one of those things that like as a DM, he probably should have like calmed things down when he saw it, but he ag he agged it on. And so uh, that's definitely a strong thing that happened from a game that I will always remember. Uh, <laughs> on a more uh, on a more uh, upbeat note, probably the, the best one that I've done as far as like DMing would be, uh, I did this one shot where it took place at a wedding. And so I didn't give the players like any context. Uh, you know, it was just one of those, like the DM just needed a week to prep. He just had a long week. So I just stepped in and did a, a one shot and, uh, it was, it was at a wedding and it was, it was kind of a, um, intrigue thing. You know, I didn't give them, I said they, they weren't into going to the wedding for the only, they were friends with the bride and that's all they knew about the whole wedding. They just were going around and it seemed to kind of almost like a slice of life thing. And then it ended up being a whole, the, uh, uh, the groom's mother ended up being, evil and trying to destroy the wedding and but they had to uncover the plot by talking to it and just by the end of it i i kept a lot of i kept a lot of movement i feel like and that's why i tried to do i tried to keep it almost a little bit chaotic where like things were always just moving and things were always happening and you know it's it's regard like what you know regardless of what they did other people were still doing their own things 
and uh, it created this really cool uh, atmosphere. It just, by the end of it, when they figured they got the plot, they actually got it before, you know, it went to hell. It's still, you know, there's a big boss fight at the end and stuff like that, but they were able to catch it in time before the quote unquote harder ending happened. It was just, it was a lot of fun and it really created a fun atmosphere. And it's one of those things that's like, you know, they still talk about it. So, man, you know, I still, and it's, it's just, it made them anytime, uh, the couple of times I've DM'd for that group, uh, they're now they're always like expecting things in everywhere. You know, they look at everything. They really like overanalyze everything because I've made them kind of paranoid with it, which is always fun. So those are, those are my two. By the way, also, uh, Dennis, I always like to believe that uh, if like you're not getting a good response out of any of your players, you just start bullying them. Just like punch him in the shoulder, nerd. Oh no. <laughs> Just get that get that one tier. Your first example is very interesting to me because there have been times when in-game fighting has happened and it has changed me as a player. Like I remember finding some loot and two party members were fighting about it in, in real life, and it was very like traumatizing for me, I guess, because now I don't care anything about loot. Like, I will let everyone have their first pick because I never want anyone to think that in-game loot is more important than relationships, you know? So even, I mean, I guess maybe traumatizing experiences are more memorable because they stick with us forever. But I that, that's very interesting that, you know, like fighting in-game results in maybe becoming a better player because you see your mistakes. And I love your second one, but go ahead, Alex. Yeah, no, I know it's just, yeah, it's just one of those things we got to remember, like, like, you know, strong can be good or bad. I mean, that's literally what my channel is based off of, right? It's a bunch of horror stories where people, you know, can't handle their business. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's super important to, and, and, you know, that's just, I think what happens too when you have a bunch of 18 to, to 24 year old men being stupid. So the natural state of an 18 to 24 year old man, I certainly learned from it. Again, it's one of those things like I can look at and like, for a long time, I was just like, dude, you're, you're being an idiot. You, you, but then like now that, that I've played more and stuff like that, I'm like, okay, that's really on the DM that, you know, as a DM, that's his responsibility to, to cool that situation down before it boiled over to, I'm going to punch you in the face <laughs> in real life. So Denny, do you want to go next? To kind of lead off with a bit of an anecdote myself um, in my first campaign that ever reached a conclusion. Um, one of my players characters uh, had made a deal with like the god of magic in my setting for extra power for their last fight but the cost of that was going to be that they would have to basically uh give up their life on the material plane and step into the deity's role and take over so after that fight was done not all of the players were aware of this deal that had been made so as this as that fight had ended and this character began to say their goodbyes to everyone like it was kind of beginning to dawn on people like, wait a minute, what what did you do? Like, what have you done? And another of the players during this campaign had been playing their father figure. So there was like a very close connection there. Like a lot of the role play during the campaign had been so intimate during that whole time. And by the time they came to say goodbye to him, like all of us just broke down with tears at the table. Like I was like, oh, this is the epitome of my D and D career. Oh, I've made everyone cry, <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean that it, that left an lasting impression on us. Like I think last week, that player character was like, "Man, my DMing goal is to make everyone cry like Denny did." <laughs> and I'm, so it's something that's still on our minds. Um, to add another one, those two same characters, a bit more of a a sadder experience. Well, I guess that one was a pretty sad experience, but less positive. Um, I can take things into pretty dark narrative places in my games. And uh, that same character got a modify memory performed on them. And they the memory that was modified was just this father figure had been horrible to them. So they wanted nothing to do with them. They were going to be indoctrinated into a cult. So they're like, yeah, you need to cut your ties with everybody you knew. So this man was terrible to you. So the party saved her. And she's like, I can't be anywhere near that man. And so everyone, it, it was just so difficult. And by the time they did a greater restoration, that character remembered all their memories, remembered everything, the, like the way they had treated their father figure and just another moment of like, they rushed to them and just uh, deeply apologized. Like that ended up having actual hugs at the table. And um, 
yeah, I mean, they're moments like these. They 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 can leave positive or negative impressions, but definitely impressions for sure. And uh, I think I don't. You can only get experiences like that when the players and the characters really lean into being friends and supporting each other in and out of game. Like I said, I I can take these games to dark places, but that's be- only because I know that my players trust me. Like if it were just some random table at a a, a gaming shop the the connection wouldn't be as close or i wouldn't even dare trying that with strangers like that's the last time they're gonna ever want to play with me but the strong laughter warm smiles tears unified anger those are some of the most when those moments happen you know you've made a great impression for your games i know it's affected me that way for sure yeah you trusted well your players trusted you as a dm and you trusted your players as well to reciprocate that and to lean into it and not to fight you on my character wouldn't do that or something like that. Um, that's, that's a great example. Thank you. Um, Fred, let's hear from you. I was thinking about this really hard in terms of like when it's happened. And I, this is actually Opal, the hardest question for me. So I, I have had to write a lot of stuff down and remember a lot of stuff. I was trying to think about what has had the greatest effect on me or other players at the table. And I think it's definitely, I agree, yes, if you can get the players to cry, that's that's certainly, it, it's pretty um, outwardly, um, you can see what's going on. They're definitely, they've been affected emotionally, and sometimes that can be a good experience and bad experience, and there's been plenty of good experiences at the tables I've seen. Um, the other one I have to say is, I'm going to say laughter, because one of the things that my own group is, it's a big thing for us, is like, We've all got our own lives, there's family, there's work, there's just the chaos of trying to keep things going, and we've been playing together for a long time, and and so our experience is def- different to just being with strangers, and I found that the, the, the better experiences I've had is when I've had like a family group, or I've had very close friends playing together, that's usually when things actually seem to work, and because like life is can be hard, um, laughter often winds up being our our go to, and if we can get that, that's actually, I mean, I know that's sort of often viewed as like, oh, you're just goofing off, you're not really playing Dungeons and Dragons, you're not really, you know, taking it seriously. But actually, we're taking it very seriously. We're taking the fact that we need to laugh now for the next two or three hours extremely seriously because we haven't been able to do that all week for whatever reason because uh, there's been other things to deal with. So I think that's where it's happened the most. Um, so I guess I'm supposed to give you a story about when something's happened that sort of relates to this. Uh, I'm going to give you the, the story of Sam Hain. My brother's name is Sam, and he created a character called Sam Hain. Uh, this character was a shifter in a 4 campaign, and I presented uh, the group with a, a war between a werewolf clan And when I say werewolf clan, I don't mean every werewolf is like evil. Like it's just a werewolf clan, okay? So don't put a, every every single werewolf is like bad and uncontrollable, furious monster going nuts and eating everybody. And and they were warring against the high elves. And so this, the group had actually come into the situation where they had to try to mediate between the high elves and the werewolves. And it had a very time sensitive thing. If they didn't do things in a time in a timely manner, then something would happen. It was like a ticking clock. And um, the problem was that the battle between the high elves and the werewolves was so bad, and it, it was actually orchestrated by one of the werewolves who had deposed and killed the 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 old werewolf leader. And he actually kept the peace with the high elves. This new one was the biggest problem. He was the strongest out of all of them, and ultimately, everything they would do would be just uh, messed up by his the control he had over the clan. And so my brother, who was playing a shifter, not a werewolf, but a shifter, they came to the conclusion that they had to figure out how to get rid of him. And they're like, like, who's going to get rid of him? And if we get rid of him, like, who in the clan is going to replace that, um, that leader, even if we are successful in getting rid of him? And in the end, they decided, well, actually, maybe it has to be um, Sam Hain, my brother's um, character. 
So they orchestrated a plan for a challenge between the um, the clan leader and his character, and he almost died multiple times. Um, they had to get up. They got up to all sorts of mischief, and I can assure you that mo uh, most of it went down very badly. And we were quite sure. I was quite. I was convinced that that was going to be the end of the campaign. His character would die, and then the rest of the party would be ripped to pieces by a clan of angry werewolves. Um, but that's not what happened. He did actually make it. Um, and yes, there might have been a little bit of pushing on my part as the dungeon master to make sure that would happen. But that was beside the point. The point was, when it was all done and dusted and the leader was deposed and and was dead, there was an opportunity to rectify all the problems with this war between the High Elves and the Werewolves. And they realised that the only way to do this is that one of them had to actually lead the clan. And it didn't make any sense for any of the other characters to be able to do this. But it made a lot of sense that his character could because he was the one who went into single combat with this um, this leader. And so he had to make that decision. Now, the problem is with making that decision is if he does that, he doesn't get to play that character anymore. That character is now the leader. That story, they move on from that story. They go somewhere else. That's done. And he realized that. They all realized that. And I said, so what do you want to do? I mean, you don't have to be there. You can just let them do their thing. You've done the best you can. Or you can you can wind up stepping up and being the new leader. And he said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll be the new leader. I'll, I'll I'll take control of the situation. They they will acknowledge me because in single handed combat I have beaten their leader, and that's how this clan works. And in the end, my brother David came up to me and he said, "You know, um, Sam's really upset." And I was like, "Okay, you're going to have to explain this to me because my brother was playing in the same. Both brothers were playing the campaign and some sisters." Okay, so um, he said he's really upset. He said, "Look." He really liked like playing that character, but now he doesn't get to play that character. And he knows that and he's accepted that. And he said, he, he's been crying. And I was like, I didn't realize this. And I was like, okay, all right. And then he said, but here's the thing. He, he also said to me that it's, it's the best thing that he's ever got to do in any kind of game ever, even though it was so hard to do. And I was like, really? Okay, all right. Because his effect on the world was so significant it's like you couldn't do anything more. It's like it's like becoming a king in some respect, and that's how your character ends. It doesn't wind up, you know, drinking itself to death in a tavern or being obliterated by a hydra in, in a battle or anything like that. That's how that character ends. So he actually, he really, he was really happy as well. So he's crying and he's happy. And I'm like, okay, oh, well, we've kind of achieved two things. Um, that is probably the only time that I can think of that something really significant has happened at my table, and it was with family and very close friends. I have a lot of thoughts about everything that you said. Um, but first off, when I've had times when I've played in campaigns where characters had to be left behind, maybe um, someone's schedule didn't work out, so their character becomes an NPC, or you move on to the next campaign in the same universe or world and you, you have the opportunity to meet up with your old characters. Those have been very meaningful because it ties in the whole story, the whole campaign um, and the world together in just very meaningful ways. So I think that was a really cool call that you made um, to make your brother's character an NPC. Um, and I'm, I don't know if you interacted with him in the future, if, you're, if your uh, brother's character got to interact with his, his, his own character, but I think that those are always rewarding moments. And secondly, I agree with you that playing with close friends and family really enhances the um, the storytelling and the role playing because you're all just so comfortable with, with each other. Like when I played with strangers and they don't role play, I have a hard time role playing and I force myself to role play, but it's never as rewarding as when you can just be your, be your natural character's self, I guess. That doesn't mean to say that you're that you have to play yourself as your character, um, but I think that's often what happens, right? Like you just kind of fall into your own your own story. <laughs> I I'll share one when I was a player and one when I was a DM. As a player, I, I was playing in um, my husband's campaign. We were playing Curse of Strahd, and I'm not going to give any spoilers, hopefully. But there was something very meaningful that happened in Curse of Strahd, so. Here we go. There was a character who experienced significant stress and loss and just completely was dehumanized in the eyes of like the whole world that we were in. 
Um, and it was really easy for us to just label this character as crazy and just like move on, not interact or maybe even be fearful of this character. Um, but my sorcerer really connected with this person um, and listened to their story and helped them in like real, real D&D &D real ways um, that ultimately turned their crazy into just like understanding. And they became just this strong ally that eventually helped provide pivotal insights into our missions. Um, there was a huge payoff of being this hero who, uh, you know, was like a hero to a normal person. Um, something that you could have just written off. And my DM could have easily just you know, not leaned into that and just had the character stay crazy, true to narrative or whatever. Um, but the fact that my DM was willing to adjust based on my character choices, um, adjust the the NPC and really make that meaningful bond. That's that's like a, a story where I like I felt like a hero as a player and as a character. Um, and that has shaped how I played, you know, in future games. As a DM, I was thinking about this experience when Alex was speaking. I was playing with my siblings as well as my husband. Uh, my husband had incorporated his character from his very first campaign that a few of the other players had played in. Um, but this character was had a hidden identity, like had hidden themselves. And we hadn't mentioned that this was the same character. So my other siblings had no idea that this was the character that they had played with before. Um, they had gone to a masquerade where they were meeting, I think, like the Lady Death or something like that, like some otherworldly being who had the knowledge of who this character was. And everyone was doing their own thing, trying to, you know, piece together their own information as part of this ball. And this and, and my husband's character went to go speak to the omniscient being. And it was actually a slip of a tongue because it wasn't supposed to be like the reveal moment. But I accidentally said... And you, name of the actual character from the first campaign. And when I slipped up with that name, all my siblings were like, whoa, whoa, who's this character? We had no idea. Um, they were just like, I think it just like shifted the whole tone of like, whoa, we had no idea that this was the person, but now it all makes sense. Just kind of doing like a bait and switch where they had already been interacting or, or like really invested in this character previously. It just helped like push the campaign forward to like more interest. Um, so as a DM, I think that a tip that I would have is like incorporate things that have happened in past campaigns and maybe not necessarily like if they're in the same world that doesn't have to like, you don't have to make callbacks per se, but understanding how your characters, how your players have played and how they value their character and the things that their characters value. I think when you push that into the game, that helps them uh, make meaningful connections with the story. I agree entirely with you, Opal. Having old PCs show up in n new campaigns is one of the most fun things that I've done as a DM. More details about this story in one of my in my uh, final boss video. But at the climax of a campaign, I wanted to incorporate as many as I could. So I had to have a skill challenge of running through a city during a demon invasion and helping three different old PCs, all of players that were at that table, because those old characters still lived in the city. Like one of them was taking care of a bar. One of them was a traveling bard. Um, and that was great. Um, but I wanted to, I know the question was about meaningful and rich experiences as individual standalone things, but I think one of the best real world things that's happened since I've been playing D&D is not a single event. It's the fact that I still talk to these people after graduating from college. Like I would, I definitely would have fallen out with four or five people and like never probably never spoken to them again if it wasn't for persistent D, &D campaigns and saying oh i want to be in the next can i be in the next one too um and it's been years since then and there's still some of my closest friends today i don't think that anything really ties people together like D, &D does and i think it's because you have to be so emotionally raw both in like role playing but also just in like how you move forward in the story um of course you can't have the fun um, examples like Fred's examples were like they were playing in a very fun campaign, but that also ties people together very well. It really connects people just experiencing human feelings. <laughs> I think a lot of people get can really confused with Dungeons and Dragons in the early years. So Dave Arneson 
um, was actually probably the spearhead for the development. And he was a tabletop wargamer. So this is big armies and so forth. He got really frustrated with that. And he created Dungeons and Dragons, which was really a, a rebellion against all of the rules. And I think it was very much about developing, and, and this is where it really happened for him, I believe, is he developed a lot of friendships by running that kind of game. It was a very different sort of game. Whereas he played a lot of uh, uh, war gaming before that, and he didn't necessarily get along with everybody. Um, and I found when I was, because I, I started with tabletop um, war gaming really too, Warhammer 40k and Warhammer, I never made any friends. I don't know anybody from those days when I played that. I got so frustrated, and so I said, I need something different. And so I looked for Dungeons & Dragons as a solution. And that's where I found the, the connection, is playing with people um, over time is the, the biggest chance of actually forming a, 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 you know, a, a decent relationship outside of just playing the game and going and doing other things as well. Um, so I, I think that's the thing that I always sort of think about is you know, I got more out of that. And I never viewed Dungeons and Dragons as a tactical game. I know a lot of people looked at it that, but it's like it was for me after playing actual tabletop war gaming, it's nothing like that as far as I'm concerned. Um, what I was always connected to was the fact that we had to work as a team together to complete a task, something that I never had to do really before. Usually it was crush the enemy. So are you saying that uh, Games Workshop can be toxic, that community? Is that is that what you're telling me? Because that is a huge shock. Uh, I never would have expected anyone to say that ever. Uh, <laughs> fun fact, I love Warhammer 40k, but I can't play it because I can't stand most of the people that play it. But I hate saying <laughs> that. It's why I played Dark Heresy, which is a Warhammer 40k roleplay game, because I was hoping that I would get that but in a role play game but nobody wants to play dark heresy so i was like oh, okay i got one i game think they're the end of it. i think they're re re basically re the, there's a new one coming out that's supposed to basically be dark heresy a really quick one you know we've talked about like player characters appearing in other campaigns is really fulfilling i have not experienced enough of this in my own games but i would love if spellcaster players more commonly invented spells and then stuck their name on them that's like all of what Forgotten Realms lore is, right? These magical beings or spellcasters who just like level up and then they're like, hey, let's do it. Let's just do something new. Create it's such a fun concept, but it's never happened at my table. Where are you? In in honor of you, I'm going to make the Denny Fireball at my next game. Oh, gosh, I'll have to just, ask you later just what it does. <laughs> it, it's just going to be wild magic. It's going to be all wild magic based. <laughs> nice. All right. So this last question I hope it makes sense because I feel like it's kind of a, a broad question. Um, but what type of monster would be especially useful in bringing about meaningful experiences? Take it for what it is. And I won't be offended if your answer is just weird. <laughs> just um, Fred, let's actually start with you this time. I want you to go first at least once. Sure. Um, so... <laughs> I was looking at this as I like, I, I'm not too exactly sure what you're trying to um, get me to say, Opal. So um, actually, I remember doing a poll uh, a while back, and I also know my group at one point were Knights of LaRue, which is basically a unicorn um, god, goddess. And I was thinking, actually, a unicorn, primarily the plight of a unicorn who's in trouble. Because usually unicorns you can never catch, that's the, that's the whole concept is uncatchable unicorn so i was thinking the unicorn would make a a good way of sort of um getting that sort of thing out of somebody because usually players if they're not completely sadistic um aren't really there to just butcher the um, unicorn and try to find loot somewhere on it which makes no sense they usually they'll be usually up for doing that um, I know my group were right into that. We wound up riding each riding a unicorn at some point. So I was thinking the unicorn would probably be the one that, that pulls that out the most. But I think ultimately, no matter what monster it is, even if it is a unicorn or something else, there's some key things that, that probably need to be happening for that to potentially get what you want out of it. And that is the monster, if the monster's injured, and needs assistance and so it's no real it's no real challenge to just go and, and kill it and uh you you don't get anything for doing that because it, it is really such it's just not a threat um 
dealing with some creature or monsters that are enslaved. I know uh, it's not the in thing to talk about nowadays uh, with regard to monsters and races and everything else, slavery, but like it's the perfect place as Dungeons and Dragons is to talk about that sort of thing because the fight against it is like much easier to achieve in a Dungeons and Dragons game than in real life, right? So um, let's get some practice in before we have to do it for real. Um, so I think that's a really good place to make it work and then uh, uh, just a creature in trouble. It doesn't have to be injured, doesn't have to be enslaved, but there's some sort of trouble going on. And I guess what you'll, I, I always think of this as like the thing you're going for, in my opinion, is you're looking for character, player character sacrifice. You know, where they, they actually are up for, I'm going to do something that's going to sacrifice the character because that would be for the greater good in the situation. Um, I guess following like the traditional hero or heroine um, storyline, which is like, you know, um, they usually they they usually add an, uh, end in a tragic manner, uh, but yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, and that seems to be the thing that I think would draw out the kind of response you're getting to be meaningful. The times when I, as a player, have had a moral quandary has been when there's a monster that's like not threatening, but you know, like it could be threatening, or maybe it has been threatening, but it's not an active threat. So you're like, do I kill it? Do I just like? tie it up you know like those really bring out these like moral choices that you have to make as a character and i think that that does make it way more meaningful because if something's attacking you of course you're going to kill it right like it's like your self-defense yeah i think that your answers are very very on point thank you fred denny let's go with you next okay and i put on a happy face um, as if he was very surprised by that <laughs> um as far as uh, monsters that might be especially useful in bringing about meaningful experiences, um, I think some of the criteria that might help make almost, I I don't think it's very monster specific and it's more like what can you do to a monster to make them uh, be able to bring about these, uh, to, to incite emotional reaction to create meaningful experiences. We can make a monster have a connection to one of the player characters. Maybe a monster's involved in a backstory somehow. Um, if it's a typically brutish kind of monster, maybe make them intelligent, you know? Uh, you know, consider what's the creature's motive. Make them difficult to kill. Like, if it's going to be level one adventure, well, that's probably not going to be, you know, the very most satisfying thing, as opposed to, you know, if you have to time sink into the many, many sessions we did to, I don't know, kill this vampire who has a very specific way in that it needs to be killed. And I think I think if you do want some specific monster types, like vampire is a great example to become involved in a character backstory. Hags, you know, maybe you've got a character who's been cursed and they just really want to get out of that situation. Devils, maybe angels for some reason. Uh, Archfey, liches, dragons, like... There are a lot of powerful creatures that could meddle their way into the lives of characters and then also be very difficult to actually deal with. So it's a good reason for characters to go adventuring, but also to really forge a vendetta against. I think of uh, Fred's example of his brother was, you know, like a they were dealing with these werewolves. Like that's a monster that they had to in a sense, humanize or work with, and that made that meaningful connection. A couple of things, especially expanding on uh, some of the things uh, these guys said. Uh, I think, first off, this was actually a really hard question when you first uh, sent it to us. It was a really hard question to answer. I like to use sentient creatures. I am okay with an entire session, multiple sessions, or whatever, with no combat. Uh, <clears throat> I like to make basically every combat situation optional uh i'm i'm okay if they work their way around it through it however they want to do it um because i like to and I, I, i've done it as a joke i've played it as a joke uh but i like for people to consider other the other perspective the other side of it because uh, <clears throat> i've always uh there's a, so there's a scene in lord of the rings right where uh they kill one of the the easternlings and uh Faramir looks down on them you know he's like you know, 
who was this guy? Was he a, was he a dad? Was he, did he have a family? Did he have, um, you know, was he just trying to help his his country? Was he just, you know, why, you know, he was a whole person. He wasn't just a bad guy. And so anything that makes players think about things they do before they just do them, you know, uh, you know, the joke is like, oh, people are just murder hobos or whatever. But um, like uh, one, of my, one of my groups, the first thing they do is they go through this dungeon and they uh, they see a uh, uh, goblin, they shoot it. Well, so I put a note in his pocket, uh, just like from his his wife, like, oh, hey, sweetie, I hope you're having fun at work. You know, I know you don't like doing this. And, you know, your new brand new son, just, you know, we just wish you were home. And I'm so glad that we get to move next week and be done with all this life. And, uh, <laughs> you know. It's like, he's like, oh, wow. You know, it's like, yeah, I did it more as a, as a joke there, but, um, you know, stuff like that really flushes out that that these these aren't just mindless NPCs. And this is another way we can separate D&D from a video game. Because, you know, like like Nathan Drake, he goes and mows down, or especially, I always laugh with like Mass Effect and these, these uh, RPGs where you'll mow down a whole army of people. And then you'll get to like the worst bad guy. And then you like the good option is to let them go and live. You know, it's like, well, you just mowed down a hundred other people in the process. You know, in, in RPGs, we can give each one of those people, you know, their own background. And so, and then like what, what Denny said is, is, you know, give things intelligence. I like to give things that normally aren't sentient, you know, or more, you know, self-aware. I like to make them more self-aware. Uh, and, and, uh, like, I think, uh, we just talked about the Remoraz last time, you know, like to give the Remoraz, you know, intelligence and, and stuff like that. And, um, because, because then there, you have to think more behind of what you, know, behind what you're doing. You're not just killing a creature or a bad thing. You're, you're killing something that thinks that, that lives, that has its own life before you cross paths with it. And maybe we can all come out of it alive and, and positive together. Yeah. I think it's really easy to justify killing something that's, you know, like, Simple minded by its nature, it might just be more aggressive and you're like, this is a threat because that's just its nature. But when you add sentience to a creature, um, you kind of remove those options, right? Like it's not just so black and white. And that's that's one of my tips as well is like focus on sentient creatures. Um, but first, let's go to Dennis's um, answer. And yeah, we'll, we'll circle back. So this is, I agree, by far the hardest of the questions you've thrown at us today, Opal. Um, mostly because, I mean, my, my initial thought is, yes, you can use any monster really to bring about these meaningful experiences, but which ones are good at doing that specifically? And my first thought was back to, okay, what is, what are these meaningful experiences that we're trying to bring about? And uh, like when we were talking in the last question, our answers seem to all revolve around high emotions, uh, whether those are negative emotions or positive emo emotions. And my favorite way to do that is by having an interesting plot and getting the players as invested as possible. Um, I think one kind of thing that does this really well is mysteries. So when the players have unanswered questions, that they're invested in finding answers to, that is the recipe for those high emotional, meaningful moments, uh, at least at my table. Um, so I started thinking about what monsters are good as mysteries, and I came up with three uh, specific ones. The first is any shapeshifter. So dragons that can turn into humans, doppelgangers, even just mimics. Um, so things are not as they seem here. Um, another one is anything that has to do with um, messing with the character's memories. So um, I don't I haven't run or read a whole lot about the false Hydra. I don't so I don't know if that's actually a good um, pick for this, but I have run a Hydra Loth which is a type of fiend that eats people's memories. And when I ran this, um, I just had the players walking along a street and then it sort of fades to black and they wake up on a boat deck. And uh, an NPC tells them, oh, you had your memories eaten. What is the last thing you remember? 
And so we just didn't play through any of that. So the players didn't know, the characters didn't know what happened in the adventure. And it slowly got revealed to them what happened over the next several sessions. Um, that's just something that the, it's just a way to get the players invested in this plot. Like, what did we do? What are we responsible for that we don't know about? But I think one that is the best at making these high emotions is things that have to do with secrets. So players have secrets in their backstories, like, oh, I'm actually your father. Um, and Alips are really well known for their uh, secrets. They're undead creatures that learned some piece of obscure lore that was cursed. And they had, they tried to give this secret to other people. And if that secret is part of another player's backstory, um, I think there could be a lot of really interesting plays there. But like I said, when you asked me originally, any monster can be used to bring about meaningful events and feelings in your players. I don't know how well I answered the question. I did my best um, and I'm gonna cut myself off. <laughs> well, thank you for entertaining the question. I, uh, yeah, Alex, go for it. Sorry, when you first started saying that, I was so hoping you were to say a false hydra. One week after Flute was talking about how he hates the false hydra and it's terrible. And then I just wanted him to, right after that last week, have to publish on his channel someone talking good about the false hydra. Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I want to add to what Alex was saying. Hi, Jordan. Hi. We all love the, the false hydra, just so you know. <laughs> all of us here love the false hydra, okay? Just so you know, we got to say it on a video that's going to be potentially on your channel. And I know you can cut it out, but we know you're going to get the message because you're going to watch this section as you're doing your editing. <laughs> I think the false hydra backfires on DMs because no one remembers anything, like what the, what the truth is. We always have to ask clarifying questions. I'm glad that uh, Flutes talked about it because I almost just did talk about it. So we can skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you guys. I yeah, so I latch on to the sentient being part as well. I I look at monsters who reflect our own humanity back at us. Uh, monsters who are maybe created against their will or from some unfortunate event, um, such as a vampire, as was mentioned. A creature who knows how humans think and work because they were once humans or they spend time with humans. Um, and therefore they know how to manipulate players into making a choice, a very difficult choice that could be moral or immoral. And I think that when you add that element into your gameplay and characters might feel deceived, it's kind of like this like group experience of like, we were all deceived or maybe there was like inner party fighting of like, we shouldn't trust this creature, we should. Um, those can create really meaningful moments where you have to just kind of step back and like reflect on your own humanity and just like how easily you can be <laughs> manipulated into doing bad things or great things or whatever. Um, but that sentient being is like a huge factor, in my opinion, of creating meaningful moments. Well, thank you all for uh, joining this DM roundtable. Um, I think that we've said a lot of really good points for DMs to consider for how to just incorporate storytelling into their own campaign settings. And um, I don't know, I, I definitely feel like I've um, been enriched by some of your experiences. And as a player and a DM, I think that I can um, incorporate some ideas. <laughs>